Okay, I'm going to start this over. I started it right at 6.30, but our internet connection is so slow. Alright, here we go, folks. Going live now. I'm going to try it again. So we'll see what kind of an internet connection we've got, because right now it looks like it's really, really slow. So, I started right at 6.30, but... I wasn't seeing a whole lot of feedback. Oh, there it is right there. Now I see it happening. So I canceled our internet on my settings on my phone. And maybe now we can rock and roll. So, welcome. I see five folks. John right, Henry, Tom Davis. Uh-oh. Now, now I'm talking again. over myself. Let me cut, cut that off. All right. <laughs> it's never... trying to do what we do here so I see Kelly trying and Kelly I promise you it's not you <laughs> it is us uh, holy cow I wanted to talk a little bit tonight about what floods do to ponds it's pretty amazing there's areas all over the nation that have just been inundated with flooding rains I see Jason Simmons John Henry's trying it again uh, this if you guys are having a hard time seeing the video it's probably not your fault it's because I'm having to work off of AT&T data with one bar because our internet connection here is so slow. Well, uh, I was talking to Debbie a while ago about what kind of content she thought we ought to talk about. But we were hanging out in the RV and I guess probably two days ago there was some rain. And then a day ago there was some rain. There were probably two to four inches of rain that fell on top of us. And then the storm hit. And I mean, when that storm hit, holy cow.
went nuts. Uh, it started raining um, last night about 8 o'clock. It rained all night long. There are roads closed all over the place here. They're probably open now, but they were uh, hammered. Just lots of water. We drove around a little bit around some of those roads that were closed early this morning, and it's just amazing the volume of water. God does some fun things with the water. Water has so much force and so much power. I've got a gigantic amount of respect for what power water has when it's on the move. So I do want to talk a little bit about what you can expect from a flood on your pond. And I saw Kelly Hart checking in here. Kelly, this could be something we're gonna need, you're going to need to talk about. So uh, I'm going to back up just a little bit make sure I don't miss anything because I want to handle y'all's questions. Andy Eddings, John Funk, a very dry mid-Michigan, only four inches of rain this year. Holy cow. Dude, we had four inches in about four hours last night. So we would... We've had plenty, so I would be happy to share. I just don't know how to do it. Billy Bates, you're in and out for me, Bob. You know, I hear that a lot. <laughs> Especially when I have an internet connection like this one. I'm so sorry. I don't know what to do. I mean, we've got Hughes Internet, which is the only thing we can get here. And it's really, really slow for some reason tonight. Yep, okay, so uh, Shane McIntyre, Troy Todd, Shane says Hope. All is well, you should look into Link Internet. I work for them. We service your area and rural communities. You know, I'm, I'm trying to look at that. Quentin Tobolka. Hey, Palm Boss, I'm building a three-acre lake in a pasture in southern Oklahoma. What's the best way for man me to manage water, uh, water clarity and quality without any feasible water source nearby? Solar-powered aerator is your only option. You know what? I don't know that aeration, aeration really doesn't have anything to do with water clarity. Water clarity is based on soils and the water chemistry. Shane says, I'll call you. Okay, you got my number. Ring me. Call me tomorrow. I'm interested. Clayton Bounds, howdy. Billy Bates, I know all about flood issues in the bond. I bet you do. <laughs> so, um, uh, on water clarity, it's all about why it's muddy. So what I tell people is take a one-gallon glass pickle jar of water, set it on the shelf in the garage, give it four or five days, and see if the water, the mud settles out. If the water, uh, if the mud doesn't settle out, then you've got suspended colloidal. Just wash my tongue, can't do anything with it. If the water doesn't clear up, you've got suspended clay particles, colloidal, <laughs> colloidal clay particles. That's it. Which means you might need to have some help with alum or gypsum or even some lime, depending. Lime doesn't always work. Gypsum typically does. Alum always does. But alum can be dangerous. you got to be careful about that. So you don't really have to worry about aeration to make the water clear. So let me kind of differentiate that. The reason you want aeration is to keep the water autonomous with the atmosphere and allow it to cleanse itself quickly when you have more fish or more biomass than what nature would normally allow. So what you're doing with, with aeration is you're, you're, you're allowing your water to be um, moving all the time, allowing it to be cleansing itself all the time, and to be stable top to bottom. That's what aeration does for you. So, uh, solar-powered aeration can be an option. Go to pomboss.com, click on the resource guide, and there are several companies there that manufacture um, solar-powered aeration units. So, aeration serves a purpose different than offering water clarity. I see Barry Gann, Mike Cook, and Kim Moore. Now, Mike, you just asked a question, so I'm going to handle that here in just a minute. So, Quentin, managing water clarity is based on the chemistry of the water. That's really the bottom line on that. John Funk, we have four dams that failed a year ago. Yeah, that's right. I don't remember that. And you sent me those links. I looked at those. That's pretty interesting. Kenny Sanderson is checking in from northwest Kansas. Yep, yep. Shane, call and talk to me because, dude, I'm telling you, there's no cable out here. Uh, we have power, but... 
We're in such a rural part of the country, it just ain't easy. Danny Mac, Dustin Crowley. Danny Mac, good to see you, buddy. Christopher Aguilar, dude, you've been getting rained on more than we have. I mean, I can't imagine Ponds over there in southern Louisiana. I was texting back and forth with Ron Ardwan. I don't know if he'll make it tonight, but but there are houses in Lake Charles, Louisiana that were just, just remodeled after the floods from the hurricanes last year. And now those houses have water standing in them. So it ain't cool. Well, so let's talk about floods for a minute. And you guys throw a few questions at me. You know, matter of fact, I'm going to handle Tim Cook's question. Tim uh, asked a question on one of the uh, earlier um, videos. And his questions are, look at there. There's Ron Ardoin. Ponds are struggling. Yep, I totally get that. Um... So what Tim Cook was asking was, I'm stock, getting ready to stock my pond. How many grass carp? Well, I'll tell you a little story. One of my mentors for a year, a few years was a guy named Harold Arms, Arms Bait Company. He made a living sanding creeks and rivers and stuff, chasing bait to sell to bait shops back in the late 60s up through the 70s. And then I met him probably about 1981 or 82. And he'd gotten into the pond stocking business because the state of Texas stopped giving away free fish in 1980. And so Harold and I used to debate quite a bit back and forth. He would he taught me what he knew, and then when I kind of caught up with him, um, we became more competitive. He got pretty competitive, and we would argue and debate. And most of the time, he'd win the debates. Like one one I can remember specifically was he was telling me that gizzard shad were bottom feeders. That's that's They have a gizzard. That's why they're bottom feeders, so they could eat junk off the bottom. And I said, no, no, no. Gizzard shad live in the upper water column. He said, no, they don't. I said, yes, they do. Well, I was wrong. Baby gizzard shad live in the upper part of the water column, and they're filter feeders. But once they get to be six or eight inches long, they migrate into the depths, and they're going to feed in the mud. They have the, the Their mouths are at the bottom of their faces. So they're uh, they're bottom feeders. So he was he was right, but he and I would debate back and forth a lot. Well, there wasn't a, wasn't a, a, a pond stocking that went by that he did that he did not recommend grass carp. He recommended grass carp for every single pond. I didn't see the need in that. I mean, that's like buying a lawnmower if you got a rock yard. You know, why would you need a lawnmower if you're not growing any grass? That was my logic. His logic was even if you have a rock yard, grass is going to grow in it. So his thought process was, <clears throat> let's put grass carp in there no matter what. And my thought process was, let's wait until we see what the pond does. And then when we see that there's going to be vegetation that we might not want, then let's talk about stocking grass carp. So Tim Cook, here's what I'm going to tell you. I would not stock grass carp unless I see that vegetation is going to be an issue. Now here's the caveat on that. If you wait until vegetation is out of hand to stock grass carp, they can't catch up. But if you stock them, and, and it's a, okay, grass carp are like, it's a tool. It's a tool in the pond manager's toolbox. So you got to know when to use that tool. If, if, if you've got vegetation that's starting to get out of hand, then stock a few grass carp. But don't, don't go heavy. You know, stock one or two or three per acre and expect attrition. Now, what my general rule of thumb for grass carp is, it's this. Go out and map your pond. If 20% of it is covered in some kind of vegetation that's expanding every year, then calculate that volume and start off with three grass carp per acre, 10 to 12 inches long, so they're not likely to get eaten by your fish. My throat's still playing games. So, if you don't have vegetation, I don't see the need to stock grass carp. Because here's here's a part of the way I see this. <clears throat> I think some aquatic plants are valuable to a fishery. I analyzed a fishery last week, a week before last in Kansas, where we had designed, actually it was in Missouri, right on the Kansas-Missouri border near Drexel, Missouri. And so... When we designed that lake years ago, probably started designing it six or seven years ago, I knew at some point 
that we'd be seeing grass growing up in shallow areas. So we minimized the shallow areas, put them where we wanted them. We deepened other areas that we didn't want plants grown in. And one of the coves on that lake was solid rock bottom. Well, it cost a little extra money, but the landowner was willing to spend it. He brought a track hoe in with a hammer, and he, he beat, the, beat the rocks up, broke the rocks up, so we could get depth. Now, if it's solid rock, you think, well, plants aren't going to grow there. But I know this. When it rains and water flows into that cove from above, there's going to be silt flow in, and plants are going to grow in it. Well, I'm so glad we did it, because when I looked at that cove a couple weeks ago, the only place that plants can grow is right around the perimeter because it's two feet deep. You know, so where I'm going with that is we want some plants to grow because that's, that is, is a scape cover for baby fish, baby bluegill, baby bass, baby whatever you've stocked, baby red ear, you know, baby fathead minnows early on. So you do want some aquatic plants going on there. So, uh, but, if aquatic plants are a nuisance and you want to use grass carp to, uh, to, to arrest them or kind of keep them at bay, it's better to start off with a few than it is to start off with too many and they eradicate all the plants. So if you have too many, they're going to eat all your plants. We really don't want that. We don't want them to do that. So that's my take on stocking grass carp. I don't like to stock them unless you need them. And I love Harold Arms. He's been gone. Good gosh, I guess he died seven or eight years ago. Uh, I want to miss him, but it's kind of hard. We argued. Ron Ardwan, ponds are struggling. Stanley, good evening, Bob. Yep, Debbie and I are doing great. Debbie, as a matter of fact, she's right over there. Babysitting two little young grandkids. We, uh, She and I cooked for them, fed them, loved on them, did a little bit of homework with them. Homework, all the homework you can do for a five-year-old and a three-year-old. We kept them from murdering each other, and we fed them, and they ate. So I, I'm going to take that as a win. <laughs> all right, and Stan, good to see you, buddy. Here you're going to see T Cameron before long. That's cool. Robert Hudson, that's right. Hashtag Palm Boss Magazine. Click like. Share this to your timeline. You're eligible for a drawing for a, check this out, Palm Boss hat. And a Pond Boss mug. Say it with me, Fred. Bingaman, I see you there. That knows how to keep hot things hot and cold things cold. We don't know how it knows, but it knows. Jeremy Duckworth, you are this week's winner. And Leanne came up with a great idea. You know, um, when you get time, go to pondboss.teachable.com. That's where the Institute of Higher Pondology sits. So for you folks that are thinking about building a new lake or you've got a nice lake that you want to make better, the purpose for the Institute of Higher Pondology, we got 22 videos on it. I took Chico with me two weeks ago. We're going to have five more videos that we can add to this curriculum later. So you can buy these modules. we got six different modules. Six, something like that, six. So... Uh, so you can educate yourself, and they're all educational, entertaining, fun videos to help you learn to be a better pondmeister. So if you will share this or, or tag five people that you know that have ponds and introduce them to what we do, then you'll be eligible for a 10% off on the Institute of Higher Pondology. So let me see here. Kenny Sanderson, what about turbidity that occurs during flood and heavy rain events and how it affects actively spawning fish? <clears throat> you know, I'll, I'll tell you this, Kenny. I have seen spawns completely disrupted by these kinds of rain events that we've been seeing across the part of the Midwest, mu much of Texas, all of Louisiana, and a good part of the South and Mid-South and some of the Eastern Seaboard. So when fish are actively on nests and the water rises six or eight inches, mud flows in, turbidity increases, those fish are going to be vigilant staying on top of those eggs. The problem happens when that silt begins to settle. This is what's really interesting about this. Eggs have to breathe. If they can't breathe, they won't hatch. So part of the, the daddy's job that's managing that nest or that bed 
Part of his job is to keep the water moving around those eggs, have a little bit of mild turbulence in those eggs so that they can breathe. So the shell of the egg is permeable. So it can absorb oxygen from the water. And of course, the good news is it doesn't take long for these eggs to hatch. When they hatch and become swim-up fry, then they're good to go. <clears throat> but if there's so much turbidity coming in that, that the mud settles out on top of the eggs, it can suffocate them. Now, I've actually seen that. I'm not going to tell you that's common, but I've seen it. Trevor Fry, good job, dude. Uh, Ron Ardwine, I've seen a lot of Bremen bass in many ponds that have what looks like columnaris and other bacterial infections due to degraded water quality with what with all that's been going on down here. Now, here's what that means to me. Now, Ron is uh, Lake Area Pond Management down there in Lake Charles, Louisiana. If you guys are in that part of the country, check him out. But what he's seeing there is he's seeing some bacterial infections show up on fish. Well, what goes on is when a pond is able to sit static for a while, it becomes stable. And when it becomes stable, the fish respond to that stability. But when you get a big rain or a, you know, a big rain with a drastic temperature change, it changes the chemistry, changes the chemistry a lot. And when the chemistry changes, then that can distress the fish. So when the fish become distressed, it weakens their um, immunity systems. So as they're, as they're weakened a little bit, it makes them a little bit more subject to uh, bacterial infections. And that is very, very common, especially in floods. Especially in floods on top of ponds that have been static for four or five months, where the pH is stabilized. You know, let's, let's say, for example, um, around Lake Charles, Louisiana, the pH is probably close to 6. And when these fresh rains come in, the pH is probably 6.5. Hits the dirt, brings dirt in. Minerals are absorbed. pH can spike up to 7.5 or 8 and then plummet back down towards 6. So when that pH plummets like that, that's enough to change the way a fish metabolizes and it changes its cellular structure it changes its electrolytes, and it weakens it. So when it's got to deal with drastic water quality changes, and this time of year, I promise you, in South Louisiana, some of those ponds were stratified. Some, some had warm layers of water sitting on top of cold layers of water. And when you get that amount of rain, eight or nine inches, coming in and flushing that water out, totally changes the water chemistry. Mike Cottrell Dude, I, I wonder how much water you've got. Holy cow, you've had a huge amount. <clears throat> Billy Bay, speaking of carbon floods, I've been finding plenty of surprises this spring from last summer's flood. First, bullhead catfish. He's, he's in the Maryland area, by the way, That for everybody that doesn't know Billy Bates. Bullheads and snakeheads and money. So he saw a couple of big carp. He sent me an email. I haven't had a chance to respond to it yet because I've, I've had stuff to do. But, uh... Uh, snakeheads in Maryland. You know, he's Billy's doing some work on studying how bass and um, snakeheads interrelate. I know this, the biggest fish eats the smallest fish. Bill Russell, checking in, was fishing in your backyard. Well, Bill Russell, if you're fishing in your backyard and didn't get a bite, give me a call, we'll stock it. Chris Arthur, Frank James, Travis Paul Smith, Mike Cook, Todd Austin, Let's see here. Dustin Crawley again, Mike Cook. Yep, Nancy Bishop. We dug our one-third acre pond in December, stocked it in March. The area was swampy. Most like the dirt, most of the dirt was clay-like. Light grain color. The water is now almost light gray. The color almost matches the mulch hay we put down to grow grass. Hasn't really rained much here in northwest Georgia in a couple of weeks. We can see about a foot down right now, less after heavy rain. Any advantages or disadvantages? adding dye other than changing the color of the water um i'll tell you this all you're really going to do is change the color of the water now nancy one of the things we want in a brand new pond is we want it to to grow its own food chain but when you add that dye then you're going to disrupt it from its best opportunity to grow a food chain 
So I would not diet this time of year. Now, if you're wanting to diet to try to clear it up, there's probably better ways. Like I said a while ago, take take a jug or a, a, a pickle jar, a gallon jar of water that's muddy. Set it on the shelf in the garage. Look at it in a week. See if it's settled out. If it's settled out, then you're going to be okay unless there's something stirring the water up. If it doesn't settle up, you may need to amend the water. <clears throat> if you need to amend the water, you can look at things. I would look first at gypsum, especially in northwest Georgia. Let's see here, Travis Paul Smith, trying, still trying to finish a one-acre pond, only any, eight inches of rain since Sunday. Well, I know. I feel it, buddy. J.P. Clayton from Pecan Plantation. Hey, J.P., connect up with me, man. We're going to be moving into, I think it's 9416 Ravenswood once we close. Well, it's going to be a while, but we're moving to plant Pecan Plantation. I got some really fun ideas I want to do with the lake. Lake Granberry up there, which we can talk about later. Uh, Danny Max says, I'm thinking the freeze caused a lot of stress. Yeah, a huge amount of stress. And now it's rain. Yeah, and you, what are you, you going to do? You can't do anything about it. Robert Hudson. Hi, Bob. What relative weight should I call large mild bass? That's a great question. I'm on year three of my pond, and from your recommendation, it's time to start culling bass this coming fall. In middle Georgia, my goal is quality large mild bass and bluegill. I've been feeding bluegill MVP for two years. And I'm amazed at the results. Dave Davidson, my longtime friend and moderator at PondBoss.com's Ask the Boss discussion forum. Good to see Dave Davidson. Robert Hudson, that's a great question. <clears throat> so let me do it this way. When you're in year three of a pond that's been stocked with bass, bluegill, and the other associated fishes in middle Georgia, and, you know, this is going to hold true pretty much for anywhere. By the time you get to the end of year three, we know that those originally stocked bass are reproducing. Those are the ones you want to cull. So by the time you get to the end of year three, and all, actually all the way through year three, when you catch some bass, weigh them and measure them and compare them to the standard curve. Now, if you folks don't have the standard curve, don't know what that means, Send me an email and I will send you a, um, a spreadsheet where you can plug in links and weights and compare your fish to standard. For, here's standard. Here's what that means. A 10-inch bass should weigh 10 ounces. A 12-inch bass should weigh 12 ounces. 14-inch bass, 1 pound and 7 ounces. A 16 is 2 and a quarter. An 18 is 3 and a quarter. Well, on an XY graph, that plugs into a curve. So what you can do is weigh and measure your fish, add them to this curve, and see where they lie on that curve. Now, at some point, typically during year three or at the end of year three, is there's going to be a size class of fish that begin to decline. And it's typically typically 12 to 14-inch bass or 10 to 14-inch bass. The bass that are 18, 19, 20 inches, they're going to do great because they can eat those 10-inch bass. So what you can do is weigh and measure those fish, plug them into this uh, spreadsheet, and the, and the fish will tell you. You know, when, you, when you've got a 14-inch bass that should weigh 1 pound 7 ounces, the weighs 1 pound 2 ounces, it lost weight. Because it had to be 1.7 to get to 14 inches. So once you, because well, what will happen is your, your fishery will go like this, then it will level, level off. <clears throat> so when it levels off, it's time to cull. It's time to harvest. Look at your pond like a garden. You're going to be growing it, you know, nurturing it, feeding fish, whatever you're doing with your management. At some point, you got to harvest a few fish. And when you weigh and measure fish, and then based on your goals, your harvest plan comes into play right there. So, been feeding MVP for two years. I, your blue, now, let me tell you what else is going to happen. By about year four, if you're not culling those intermediate-sized fish, your bluegill number is going to drop. We worked on three lakes two weeks ago, and out of those three lakes, two of them saw sharp declines in bluegill numbers. And it was all because it was time to start culling. They were in their fourth year or fifth year. So it's time to, it's time to cull some fish. But weigh and measure some fish, plug them into that spreadsheet. You're going to see the size classes that need to be culled. I'm pretty excited about going to Pecan Plantation, Brother Clayton. So uh, let's connect up. 
I was looking at some of Karen Gomez's photographs today. That's an amazing place. Christopher Aguilard. Let's see. Robert Hudson. It's a two-acre pond. Okay. Gotcha. With a two-acre pond, Robert, I'd say start calling. Weigh and measure your fish. <clears throat> Here's a general rule of thumb. You're gonna you're, by the end of year three, you're gonna need to be calling somewhere between twenty and thirty pounds of bass per acre. Now, don't take that totally to the bank. Every pond's different, and the way that you differentiate whether it's twenty pounds or thirty pounds is how the remaining fish respond. If your catch rates plummet or your fish are gaining weight, that's gonna tell you when it's time to stop. So that's the way I see it. Uh, Chris Fargalar, Bobby, you and the missus need to come. To me and Ron, me, me and Ron, our Dwayne DJ uh, dies Cajun restaurant before crawfish season ends. Well, you know what? I might just take you up on that, but the missus, she going to be taking care of a new house that she found, she bought. I didn't look at it until after I'd signed the contract because if the wife ain't happy, the life ain't happy. There's your, hey, there's your fisheries tip today, boys. And mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. And mama don't like living in an RV all the time. She's good with it now because we have internet and we can watch Netflix and she loves Outlander. Now I know Kenny Sanderson knows what I'm talking about. We just finished season two. I'm going to have to go buy a kilt. I got to shed some pounds first. Okay, let's see. Ken Dow checking in from York Springs, Pennsylvania. What do you think about green sunfish in a two-acre pond with an established largemouth bass population? <clears throat> you know, Ken, I, I really like that question. i tell you what I think about green sunfish. Green sunfish in uh, York Springs, Pennsylvania are going to spawn one time a year. And they have a big mouth, so they're going to compete with young bass. So they're going to eat young bass. So let's kind of go through that equation a little bit. The biggest problem in northern tier states like that is largemouth bass tend to become overpopulated and bluegill tend to become overpopulated. So if you've got green sunfish, they're spawning once a year versus bluegill, they're going to spawn once a year, maybe twice, and grow really fast. You know what? I think it might be a pretty good idea. <clears throat> now, the thing about it is you're still going to track your lengths and weights. You're still going to need to track growth. And if the bass aren't gaining weight like they should, you know, I mean, I've seen 12-inch bass in upstate New York. They're seven years old. And that's normal. That's not normal here. You know, so here's my direct answer. I'm thinking green sunfish in a two-acre pond with bluegill, with largemouth bass is not a bad thing. I'm okay with it. Ashton Hunter, glad to join you from Texas. Still intend to get with you on our 13 acre dock, dirt pit. Should be fun. Hey, Ashton Hunter, I'm in. <clears throat> I want to take a minute uh, and talk about our sponsors. I love Purina Mills. And I'll tell you why. i tell you why I love Purina Mills. We sent them a letter back in 1995. Holy cow, that's 26 years ago. And asked them to buy an ad. That's all we did. Not only did they buy the inside front cover of Pond Boss. Here it is right here. They have had the inside front cover of Pond Boss magazine since 1995. But what I loved was they called us and said, Hey, not only do we want the inside front cover... We want to be able to talk to you about how we can create products because we see that, or we believe you're in an industry that's going to grow. And they were right on. I mean, this industry's grown like crazy. So Purina Mills has worked really, really hard. I'm an ambassador for them, have an endorsement agreement with them, but I promise you, I would not talk about it if I didn't think they had great, great products. And they do. You know, my favorite right now is Aquamax MVP, high-protein fish meal beast based fish food that grows gigantic fish. Now, if your fish eat fish food, bluegill, channel catfish, hybrid stripers, tilapia, um, feed train largemouth bass, 
Aquamax is as a product for you guys. Also love Texas Hunter. I had a guy email me today. He wanted to buy a Texas Hunter feeder. Sent the email in. Ordered the feeder for this guy, Mike Brammer. And they shipped it today. He'll have it Friday. You know, I love their customer service. I love their products. I love how responsive they are. And they can deliver that feed. I also love Greg Grimes. Greg Grimes, longtime friend. One of my favorite stories about Greg. He's in Ball Ground, Georgia, by the way. Aquatic Environmental Services is Greg. Greg uh, tells, told me this story four or five times. <clears throat> when he was in college, he found a copy of Palm Balls Magazine, and he subscribed to it. And that was in the mid-90s. And he read every issue he could get. And I don't know that Palm Balls influenced him to go into the pond management business, but when he got through going to school and at the University of Georgia, he went into the pond management business, and now he is one of the superstars in our industry. David Schneiderman, Easy Docks of Texas. If you're looking for a floating dock, get in touch with David Schneiderman. He knows what's going on. He can coach you. And all these guys are honest. I, I, I'm, I'll tell you this. I will not talk about these folks if they're not stellar, upstanding citizens of their community and have great products. So, there you go. That's my endorsement. <clears throat> Travis Paul Smith's Feeding Aqua Max Feed. Which one will grow faster, hybrid bluegill or copper nose bluegill? That is a great question. What's the biggest hybrid bluegill you have heard of? I'm going to answer that. I love that question. That's great, Travis. Um, hybrid bluegill will grow faster early because they have a bigger mouth. They can eat more food per pound or per uh, ounce of body weight. So the hybrid bluegill will grow faster in the first year, but copper nose will catch them at about 18 months, surpass them in two years, and blow them out by the third year. The biggest hybrid bluegill I've ever held is a pound and three quarters. The biggest copper nose I've ever held, two and a half pounds. Which, you know, both of those in their own rights are huge fish. You know, a, a, a two and a half pound copper nose bluegill is the equivalent of a 15 pound bass. So those things can be giant. And it, you know what? But you're not going to grow them big if you don't feed them a good feed. And that's a good feed. Frank James at Southern Nyad, Bushy Pond Weed Kill last summer, was expecting it to make a comeback this year. <clears throat> However, it's scarce as variable leaf pond weed seems to flourish. Should I expect the Nyad to return or is it not coming back? I wouldn't count it out, but I'll tell you this. Your variable leaf pond weed can outcompete it. So don't, don't mess with that variable leaf pond weed, Frank. Let it grow. It's much less invasive. Even though even though uh, bushy pondweed's native, variable leaf pondweed is too, but variable leaf pondweed has more interstitial space for one to three inch fish. So it's even better habitat for newly hatched bluegill, baby bass, etc. than bushy pondweed is. Bushy pondweed can get dense, like a, not quite like a square bale of hay, but it can get pretty dense. <clears throat> the river is up on the stripers are on the move. You know what? I cannot wait to learn about that. I cannot wait. You know, and, and JP Clayton, I got a, I don't know if I told you this the other day, but I've got a backstory there. Part of the reason we chose pecan plantation and we chose to buy property on the river is because when I was 14 years old, my parents bought a place on Mitchell Bend, which as the crow flies from where the house is, we're buying as, as the crow flies, five miles by river, probably 15 miles. But we went there every weekend. And by the time I was 15 years old, I knew I was going to make a living messing with fish. It's all because I roamed up and down that river. And I cannot wait for my grandkids to go out in that river and have the same opportunity. Now, I don't expect them to go find the passion I did, but I want them to have the opportunity that I did. So I'm pretty excited about that. Now, back then, JP, there there were no stripers in, in Lake Whitney. So we had a sand bass run come up the river. We had a channel catfish run come up the river. But we spent a lot of our time gigging carp and gar. And every once in a while, I'd stick a gig in a catfish. I didn't know it was illegal, but I ate it. You know, so uh, let's see what Billy Bates has got to say here. Can a fish make up ground that is underweight? That is a great question, Billy Bates. Let me tell you about that. 
There is, I can't think of the term right offhand. If, if a fish doesn't eat for more than four days, it can't make it up. Now, what it can do is if it doesn't eat for a couple of days, then it has a chance to fill its belly and, 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 and eat well. It can make up two days, but it cannot make up four days or five days. Now, here, here's the caveat to that. Here's the big deal. It's when you have a pond or a lake that gets in its third year, fourth year, and you're not culling fish, those fish that need to be culled, that are competing in the food chain and not gaining weight, their top end potential plummets. And you won't know it until you get till they get to the end of their lives. And once they get to the end of their lives, they might get six or seven pounds when they could have been 12. That's why culling is really, really important. You know, if you introduce fish from one pond that didn't have much forage, but that was aggressive to a pond that's not a god for, can that bass make up for lost time with aggressive feeding habits? No, it cannot. Now, let me tell you about that. If you take an underweight bass from pond B and brings it, bring it to pond A that has everything it needs, not only will that fish not be able to make up for what it lost, you've completely changed its conditioning. When you change its conditioning, about 60 to 70% of the time, that fish won't adjust to the new environment. So if a, a fish, if a bass grew up in a muddy lake, figuring out how to make a living off a of gizzard shad in muddy water, and you move it to a clear water lake, that all it's got to do is open its mouth and suck to eat, that fish is probably going to lose weight, deteriorate, and die. You know, so it's it's not just about the food chain. It's also about conditioning in the environment that that fish grew up in. Now, the only, I'm going to tell you this, the only reason, in my opinion, to move a big fish from the environment it grew up in, to put it in yours, is to inject its genetics. That's the only reason to do it. If that's not your goal, you're not doing that fish a favor, you're not doing your pond a favor by moving it in. Because there's going to be maybe 20-25% of those fish that can excel. Another 20 that will be average or above. All the rest are going to stay average or decline and die. <clears throat> That's the way I see that. Justin Shink's checking in from Central Coast, California. Good to see you. Yep, Travis says, Mom ain't happy. Life ain't happy. I'm actually drinking gin tonight. You know why? Why would I be drinking gin? Because we ran out of vodka. Ken Dowd, you bet. All right, Chance Birch. Hey, Chance. Checking in from the Dallas airport. Headed home from wildfires. Chance been fighting fires. Chance, good to see you. Robert Hudson, I still haven't received my March, April magazine. You know, that pisses me off. You know, here we pay great money to the post office to deliver our, deliver our freaking magazine, and they can't even do their job. So you know what, Robert Hudson, I'll make sure. Maybe I saw an email from you. <clears throat> if, if, if you have an email, go ahead and email info at palmboss.com. Let Leanne know that you haven't received your magazine. She will put one in first class. We'll eat the postage, and I'll stay pissed off at the post office. Incompetent bunch of people. There's my rant. Justin mixes Aquamax starter fingerling and pond fish chow together. That's a good idea. I don't I don't see anything wrong with mix, mixing uh, fish feeds. <clears throat> the pond fish chow is a grain-based fish food. The Aquamax starter is a high-protein fish food. Uh, yeah, Mike Cottrell, Walden Feed, been showing a video on Facebook of Purina and you and been in it. Yeah, you know what? Um, I saw that, Mike. There's, I think, 40 different Purina dealers today. You, you folks, if you have, uh, if you've got a Purina dealer, go to their Facebook page and see if they showed the video today. We analyzed uh, the uh, Purina Mills Research Farm Lake, six and a half acre lake, a couple of weeks ago, and we shot a video there. And there's uh, feed stores from all over the nation showing that video, but you can, you can like what Mike's talking about, you can go to the Walden feed store 
on Facebook, W-A-L-D-E-N. And you can watch that video. It's probably, <clears throat> I don't know, eight or ten minutes long. You can see some pictures of fish, see some things we did. Let's see, Travis, do you see any hint of your grandchildren following your passion at this moment? Or are they too young yet? They're way too young. You know, it's really funny because I, I raised four of my kids and two stepchildren. None of them were interested, which was okay with me. I mean, what, what I went through for 20 plus years was hard. I mean, you really had to be passionate to do it. But if you never interested, I mean, I got one sitting right over there that's five years old. It's about as scientist as you can get for that age. However, I don't know if he's going to be interested in, in raising fish or going to Mars, which I think he's kind of leaning toward Mars right now. <clears throat> Is it biologist? No, I don't know. I don't know about that. I don't know that. Uh, Travis is asking, can anyone visit the Purina Research Center? You know, no, they have, I don't know that. I don't think so, but they have a conference center there, and all their research is, pro is proprietary, so they don't share any of that research. I mean, I'm, I'm privy to some of it, but I don't get to see all of it. They're telling me what they're doing, but I can't talk about it because it's proprietary. You know, they're comparing different feeds. They're looking and doing feed trials. You know, at that research farm, they've got horses. They've got dairy cattle. They've got beef cattle. Across the street, they've got hogs. They don't want the hogs in the same place as the other animals. They've got chickens. They've got fish. They've got the biggest compost barn I've ever seen. And when you think about it, when you're feeding that many animals, you got a lot of compost you can create. So I do know that they do that. Um, now, there are groups of people that come, but the groups of people that come are typically feed store owners, sales staff, but I do know that they have some producers that come. So farmers and ranchers do come out there to be educated on how the, the feeds work, the minerals, the you know, all the different products that Purina sells. <clears throat> so, I don't think anyone can visit the Purina Center. I think you got to be invited or be part of a group. Can you come see the lakes? Well, they've got one lake, six and a half acres. You know what? I don't know how that would work. I don't know. I mean, we could try it. If somebody wants to go through, they're on their way, you know, wants to go through, they're on their way through. We could try it. I see Gary Elborn. Don't recognize your name. Glad you're watching. DeAndre Kimbro is checking in. That's a good thing. Good to see DeAndre. You guys have any more questions? <clears throat> if not, let me talk a little bit more about floods. When we get floods this time of year, yes, they can silt in nests. Typically, though, it's very, very interesting. Big fish that have a happy home with plenty of food, they don't leave. They don't have a reason. They're not motivated. Hey, Peyton Wagner. You know, I could tell the internet connection must suck because Chance has been in and out several times, so our internet connection must be terrible. <laughs> Travis, I know if you've seen the research center, they have to kill you. No, yeah, they would. No, they wouldn't. Yeah, they would. No, they wouldn't. We'll have to leave that to suspense. Billy Miller again. I see Billy on there again. <clears throat> but where I'm going with the flooding lakes, this time of year, it's not uncommon to see young of the year bluegills go downstream, young of the year baby bass go downstream, which I'm not opposed to baby bass going downstream. But what can also happen is when a pond or a lake floods, like what we're seeing right now, when those young of the year bluegill leave, the big bluegill don't, typically, some may. I mean, you guys can email me pictures of six inch bluegill hanging out in a, in a, in a, in a cow's hoof print in a pasture downstream from the pond, and I'll believe it. <clears throat> what I won't believe is that the entire population is decimated. I don't, I don't buy into that at all. So, uh, uh, but the good news is even though that population or that young of the year hatch goes downstream, bluegills, red ears, the other sunfish, baitfish, they're so resilient that they'll fill that void. doesn't take them long. So, uh, floods, 
they can change the chemistry of the water. They can change turbidity. Floods can push newly hatched fish downstream. But overall, a good, healthy pond with great habitat, a solid food chain, with a good harvest protocol. Typically, you don't see the biggest fish leave. They're typically hanging out there. There we go. Bill Russell, I did get information on the availability of prawns. I've been talking to Craig Upstrom. He's got some. He can ship them. So for you folks that are interested in freshwater prawns, he can ship them. They're like 12 to 15 cents a piece. He, he doesn't like to send them FedEx because freight's outrageous. What he does like to do is take your order, package them up, put them in a, a you know a tropical fish box, send them on like Southwest Airlines. Now we're reconnected from a crappy, crappy internet connection. Bill Russell, yes I did. I will email you the details. About 12 to 15 cents a piece, about $20 a box to ship them. He thinks he can package 400 to 500 in a box. Or if you want to come pick them up in Weatherford, Texas, you can do that. He's going to have a limited supply, but but he's going to have 150000 extra. So that sounds like limited to somebody that's in it. But, you know, if you want some, yes, you can. So, yes, and, and I've been busy trying to catch up on my writing, Bill, but I will email you. So if anybody's interested in some freshwater prawns, you know, a Macrobrachium rosenbergi, they're available now. So send me an email. I'll tell you all about it. Well, we got a lousy internet connection, and I can see a lot of people coming in and out. It's got to be a little bit frustrating for you, and uh, we'll see if we can get a little bit better internet out here. After this storm, our internet slowed way, way, way down. I'm not sure why, but it did. So, anyway, I love you guys. I'm going to close it out, wrap it up. If you got questions, send them to me at info at pondboss.com, and um be sure and check out pondboss.teachable.com and look at the Institute of Our Pondology. We have a great resource guide online, uh, pondboss.com. Subscribe to the magazine, 35 bucks a year. You go out on a Friday night date, spend 40 bucks, and it's gone the next day. But that 35 bucks lasts for a year, and I promise you, you'll get a good nugget of learning out of each issue of the magazine, probably more than that. So, I'm not sure where I'll be next Wednesday. I'll try to get a little bit better internet connection, especially if I can get coached in on that. I'll help help out help 